In a recent update to OBS, you were given the option to use FFmpeg codecs to stream. Now, this is big because previously you were only limited to X264 or hardware encoders. Now you are given two extra codecs to stream with, LibX264 and LibX264 RGB. They have their strengths and weaknesses, some worse than others, but both are very moldable into working the way that you want them to. So today, let's look at FFmpeg, the codecs that you can use with it, and whether or not it is worth it trying using it on your stream. Speaking of streaming, I'm live every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I've actually been trying the aforementioned codex, and it's, um... Well, we'll talk about it, but if you want to join me for that and you like what you see here, the links will be for it be down below. Anyway, let's move on. FFmpeg is a library of open source audio and video codecs that is heavily used in open source software. It's also the largest library of its kind. Normally, it's a command line interface program, but it's been used in programs that have a graphic interface like Blender, GIMP, Olive, Hayden Live, Handbrake, all that kind of thing. This integration has allowed open source software to compete on a level that the big name programs do, stuff like Premiere Pro, Vegas Pro, Final Cut. They don't use FFmpeg, FFmpeg because they all use their own proprietary codecs, but the open source alternatives have to because they don't have anything else to go by. OBS is another program that uses FFmpeg, but until pre the most recent version that I'm gonna be taking a look at today, you can only record with it, not stream with it. If you're recording, it allows you to use a myriad of codecs, and I'm gonna read them off my page here because I can't remember them all by the top of my head, but they are Apple Torres, H.264, HTVC, NVENC, VC, GoPro Cineform, and most importantly, LibX264. That is the codec we'll be taking a look at specifically today. It has a lower overhead compared to X264, meaning it uses less CPU at the expense of video quality. That is if you said it wrong. One of the biggest aspects of LibX264 we'll be looking at today is the custom parameters you can set for the encoder, meaning this, this codec can be molded and it shapes the way you want it to run. You want a specific bitrate? LibX264 can do it. You want specific CPU guidelines? LibX264 can do it. You want to cut out specific parts of the video? LibX264 can do it. This codec is so versatile that you can get to work how you want it to work without having to let a preset do it for you. Though, this kind of power does come with great responsibility. This is not a codec for the layman. If you want to learn how to use LibS264 and it's all of its power, you need to learn how to program it. FFmpeg uses a somewhat simple but powerful set of programmable variables that tell the encoder how to run the stream. The syntax is basically the same thing that you'd be using in the command line version of FFmpeg. We'll get into some basic testing and demonstrations in a minute, but before I do that, I'd like to give you a basic rundown of how to code for FFmpeg. I'm gonna get a little algebraic here because it's the most coherent and best way to explain this. So, the typical syntax is as follows x equals variable y equals statement so basically x is the variable as mentioned the variable is basically the is a type of value that tells the encoder what the statement should do the statement is ascii code it's written in english and in the command line but it's converted to ascii that tells the encoder what the variable should do so it's kind of in, it kind of, it's very intertwined into how it works written out in code it looks something like this dash x equals y again x is the variable so in this case you want the preset that would be the variable so type dash preset equals then medium that is your statement the preset is what defines what the statement should do so in this case the preset is needs to be set to medium see where i'm getting at here it should be mentioned that a critical variable must be used for a properly functioning encoder, and that is buff size. It's short for buffer size, and in simple terms, it keeps the encoder looking good by telling FFmpeg to check for conformity at regular intervals. This ensures that at the other end gets a smooth stream of data that prevents underflow, basically a lack of data at the other end, whether it be Twitch, YouTube, or whatever, to, to keep the stream on that end looking smooth for the viewer. The buffer size should be equal or half of your bitrate output. Any more in the stream will not look any good. All right, now that we got basics out of the way, let's talk specs. I'll be using my main rate that I use day to day, which is rocking an AMD Ryzen 5 3600 with 32 gigabytes of 3200 megahertz speed RAM. Cooling the CPU is a decooled Captain 240EX on a gigabyte Boris B450 Elite. Very basic, I know, but it's what works just well. Oh, and the graphics card is a Dazrock Challenger 550 XT, but that's not really important for our testing today. We'll be going through three rounds of testing, plus one more to test with the whole thing at 1080p with the film tune turned on and encode performance during playing play with gameplay with Civ 6. I messed that up, but I'm kind of tired of messing up today, so I'm going to leave it in there. 
During all three rounds, I'll be switching through my own OBS set scene setup with varying types of sources to really hamper the encoder. A drop frame total of less than 2% is considered okay in this case. Any more than the FFmpeg encoder is not viable for my hardware. Anyway, let's get into the discussion of the testing. For round one, we actually had some pretty good results here. The total top total missed frames was about 50 was a total of 15, 0.1% of the total dropped frames in that test. In round two, we dropped a little bit more frames, about uh, seven more, with 22, 0.7% more frames dropped. And round three saw 12 frames drop, 0.2% of the totals. Now, this first round of testing, I would say went pretty good. I mean, we were at a very basic level. We were at 720p with the, we were at 720p with the preset set to very fast at a 2500 bit rate with the tune zero latency. We kept the buffer size at 2500, which is what the FFmpeg documentation recommends that you do. We didn't see a whole lot of drop frames, of course, as we mentioned before. Um, things were very smooth, although the picture quality that I saw out of this encoder was very lackluster. It was very poor compared to X264. And from that point alone, I wouldn't recommend using FFmpeg at the settings for the fact that the quality of the encoder was not very good. During the second test, we had, you know, obviously had 22 drop frames, 0.7% of the total drop frames with the with variables presets at the fast, but the bitrate bumped up to 33,000. 3, the tune set to zero latency and the buffer size also bumped to 3,000 to keep within conformity of the encoder as mentioned as recommended by the FFmpeg documentation. Um, the quality of the video was up a little bit it really wasn't all that great. You could have done better, but it was a noticeable jump from very fast to fast with the bump bit rate bumped up only by 500 mega, uh, kilobits per second. So from that alone, it's still not great, um, but for someone who's looking to kind of up their qual encoder quality with not having to upgrade their hardware, this is still a variable option as long as they still have hardware identical to my own. As for the third test, we had the preset set to medium with the, with the bit rate set to 4,000. The tune set to film in this case, um, but the buffer size is kept to 4,000, again, to keep it in conformity. The quality of the video was still poor. I wouldn't recommend using this from the video quality alone because it was just poor. It didn't look any better from fast, um, which is funny because we didn't even go down to, down as, well as ultra fast, um, but it did not look the great, greatest, even considering the fact that we were encoding with the same preset that you would probably use on X264 still didn't look any better and if this was used on a hardware encoder it would look even worse obviously but again we didn't we dropped a few frames even still um, 12 only 12 frames which is actually better than round two's test which means the performance that we gained from this was actually better going for the transition from from uh, 3000 kilobits per second and fast preset to medium which is 4000 kilobits per second so that 1,000 kilobits, that one megabit jump compared to the 500 meg kilobits per uh, kilobit jump from the previous test. Now here's where things get kind of interesting. So we, I continued to test at 1080p um, with the FFmpeg codec, and for round two, test two, um, we dropped 22 frames. Same thing as we had before with the round test, uh, with the round two test two. But when I went to round two, round three test two at 1080p, we missed five frames, 0.2% of the total frames lost. But when it came to round one test three, which all the others were ran, ran at 720p, this was ran at 1080p. We dropped 618 frames in the total recording, 22.4% of the total frames lost. Now, depending on how you look at it, this is either a really bad thing or kind of an okay thing. I'm not running a hardware setup that is really optimized for 1080p on, on CPU. And as streamlined as LibX264 is compared to X264, it does not provide a good enough quality boost um, to justify using it if you have lower end hardware. Even still, because if I were to use the exact same, if I were to use the exact same settings on X264, I would get better performance and better quality than I would use LibX264. Just kind of want to throw that out there. But those, but because we dropped 22.4% of the total frames, it is not a viable encoder because we dropped way too many frames in too short a period of time. This was only within a couple, only within the five first first five seconds of the testing of this particular video. It was not a good test. I would not use it at 1080p with my hardware. If you had say a Ryzen 9 3900X, this would have worked a little differently. But I'm only using a mid-range CPU, which kind of what a lot of people tend to have anyway. 
it's kind of a kind of a good middle ground. The Ryzen 5 3600 is a good middle ground between the old, the lower end hardware at the Ryzen 3 end and some of the higher end hardware at the Ryzen 7 end. It's kind of a good middle ground. And the fact that I had very good high speed RAM, which is what you want for a Ryzen CPU, it really what it really kind of hammered home that this encoder hammered the CPU hard. And then again, I was also doing the testing while Civ 6 was running and if you've seen my streams, you probably would know that Civ 6 does ha does use a lot of CPU and there have been a lot of drop frames in those streams, which is why I don't stream it too often. But even still, a lot of games these days don't use a whole lot of CPU. So I was really running a worst case scenario with this kind of test, but I wanted to see how, how well this encoder could do under the worst kind of conditions. Most CPU games these days are not CPU bound. Civ 6 is just an outlier because it requires all that CPU power to roll its numbers for resources, map design, um, leaders, leaders decisions, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is taken into consideration with the CPU in Civ 6, but is not always the kind of the norm when it comes to a lot of other games. As a result, this is a worst case scenario, but you see what the worst case scenario can do for it. Most people will be having an easier time with this than other than a game like Civ 6. So to recap, so we did. A little, I even though I wanted to do more testing with this, the fact that once we moved up to 1080p, which is the kind of the golden target that a lot of people want to hit with streaming is that they want to stream at 1080p at 60 frames a second i couldn't even do 1080p 30 frames a second it was just it was so poor of an experience for me and it would be so much more poor of an experience for your viewer that i wouldn't really recommend it however at 720p even 60 frames a second it was a reasonably smooth experience the quality of the video was poor i i wouldn't i would say that the quality of the video was not good enough to use it over x264 however if you want to stream at 720p at the very least and you don't have high-end hardware i would say libx264 is a decent option i mean again you're going to get better quality out of the x264 if you really want to use cpu and if you want you know a no compromise you know smooth stream experience for you and your viewers and an nvidia tur uh, graphics card with at least the turing architecture so 1660 super or rtx cards or the, the rtx 3000 series coming out relatively soon those are better options compared to LibX264. LibX264, I think, is a kind of an outlier. It's kind of the oddball that the OBS project wanted to hammer in there because it was so useful in the recording. But the issue with the streaming version of FFmpeg and recording is that for recording, you can record in any codec you want, as mentioned before. It uses so many codecs, it's so versatile. It's, it's the possibilities are endless with how many codecs you can use. But for streaming, you're limited to X264, or in this case, H264. If you already want to get lingo lingo linguistic with uh, codex names but anyway i digress um because of that you really can't you're limited to what you can use for streaming because twitch will only transcode and accept specific codex it's like how youtube only accepts um a avc codex h264 because it can't it can't tra uh, transcode the footage once you've uploaded it to its website into anything else because it can only take that kind of codec same thing goes for twitch so if you really want my opinion, if you really want my recommendation for how you should use this codec and how to use this encoder, stick with X264 if you can. LibX264, in my opinion, is great for lower end hardware, especially when streaming at 720p at 30 frames a second. Um, but anything past that, you're gonna need some pretty high end hardware because it is very because it's very complicated of a codec despite being more streamlined than X264. So yeah, those those are my opinions of X2 Libx264. It was I wish I could have done more testing, but the jarring difference between 720p and 1080p was so just was so was so gigantic that I was like, this is not worth it. I'm gonna you know this is not worth it. I'm gonna leave it here. So anyway, if you like what you see here, give it all a big like and subscribe and turn on those stupid bell notifications. I hate saying that, but it it, it works. And anyway, if you want to see me on stream and you want to talk more about this and see me use Libx264 because I'll be using it a little bit more. Um, as a stream later today actually um if you want to see more more out of it i'll be streaming today at 6 30 p.m central standard time which by the time you get this video will be already past that but i also stream on tuesday and thursday and friday at 6 p.m central standard time so if you want to join me for that links will be down there below again anyway thank you for joining me in this video and i'll see you guys in the next one